So in this session, we cover following points. I will do a quick review of the GIS process flow and then the two data models that we have in GIS, which are raster and vector, because they lay a good foundation for the type of analysis we are trying to study in this session. Next, we'll formally define what we mean by spatial data analysis, followed by what are the various classification or categories of functions that are available in GIS. Because one way of looking at GIS is from the system perspective, one is from the science perspective, and one is from the studies perspective. Other way of looking at GIS is a set of tools or, or toolbox. Just like every engineer has this toolbox, similarly, GIS would also be assumed the set of tools that uh, provide solutions to the problem that we are proposing. Uh, as I said, there are various sets of tools or capabilities that GIS offers, offers, so we can define them broadly under vector raster categories. And then finally, we'll spend some time in understanding the pros and cons of using a vector or raster-based uh, spatial database analysis operations. Now let us uh, spend some time and maybe do a review of the GIS process flow that you are aware of. So we start with first defining the problem. One minute, sorry. And defining the problem that could be maybe a suitability study, finding out a new location for certain uh, company. And then we define our criteria, which could be proximity to our proximity to our clients, connectivity to the routes, and so on. But uh, and next, you for supporting that kind of analysis, we build or create the data sets wherein majority of the time is spent. And the beauty of uh, having an information system is it should support the type of analysis that we are looking for. This is where the capabilities of the GIS or the GIS analysis could be done based on the set of uh, uh, tools that the GIS software provides us. Uh, based on the analysis, the output could be generated, and based on that, the decision could be taken, and then the problem could be refined in case the decision is not as per our uh, kind of uh, assumptions. So we can repeat the whole process. But the important thing is we, we spend time in data import and creation, but ultimately we are building this GIS system so that it should help us. And this is where the capabilities of the GIS is being uh, this comes out in a, in, a, in a very large way because we are able to perform some GIS based analysis using the data that we have captured. Now in GIS, you are aware that there are two kinds of data uh, that you can represent. Either the data could be in the vector base or a raster base. So vector model uh, is primarily used for uh, representing the discrete phenomena can be represented in the form of a point lines or area or polygons having the associated characteristics or attributes. Second is the raster model where we have a regularly spaced grid cells and then we extract information based on those pixels or grid cells. What you see on this right hand side is the is the infographic depicting how the the GIS is able to model the real world phenomena in either raster or a vector representation or a model. So given this real world, we have a stream, a group of patches of tree uh, and two places, and we have a house. So in raster, it will be represented, as you know, a group of pixels will represent that phenomena. So the stream could be represented by this series of pixels through which the stream uh, crosses the study area. Similarly, the group of forest uh, or the tree patches could be represented by these pixels and these pixels on the upper right. And assembly, the house could be represented by the lone pixel as given in, in this uh, graphic here. Similarly, for the vector based representation, as you know, there are three parameters we have a point, line, and a polygon. So, house could be represented as a point here, and then the stream could be represented as a series of points connected together that make a line. And this group of trees uh, patch could be represented by a polygon or an area where the first point and the last point are the same. So this is what we know of. So we know that the GIS would represent the real world either in the form of a raster or vector. And I'm not getting into the other uh, 
advantage and disadvantage of the raster versus vector that you have already studied. But important thing is this, that vector data is ideal for representing the discrete kind of a geographic phenomena. We call them object and then raster is good for the field kind of a geographic phenomenon. Something we call as a continuous. And then the area is covered by grid or we call them as pixels and the attributes are recorded based on the single value. Generally it is a majority feature that is represented in the cell value. So here you can see in the vector how does the land use uh, map will look like and the vector or raster how it will be represented. Now coming to this uh, topic today, so we are, we are trying to understand the spatial data analysis. So it can be defined as computing the new information. So important thing is we are computing new information that is providing new insight from the existing store data. So based on the GIS process flow that we have discussed, defining the problem, defining the criteria, importing or building the data sets and coming all the way now to for getting the fruits of our labor, where we are trying to make sense of the data, get insight of the data, reveal patterns and kind of a trend. This is where the beauty of GIS is being uh, coming to the forefront. So anytime we are trying to see the relationship between one feature or other, or how does a one phenomena relate to the other feature or phenomena over a distance, we are trying to perform the spatial data analysis. And then primarily, broadly, uh, we can uh, categorize either as a vector base or a raster base based on the two data models that we have got. Now, before getting and learning more about those other uh, spatial data, data analysis aspects, let's go a little bit back in time and then maybe see how does a pre-computer age a spatial data analysis is was used. So it is not a new topic, it is being used uh, widely. And if you happen to browse through any textbook, you will come across this classic example of Dr. John Snow, London Cholera Academic, which happens in uh, London, Soho District in 1854. So at that time, it was not known that cholera was a waterbound disease. It was assumed to be kind of a mysterious disease. A lot of people were dying uh, because of this mysterious disease. So there was Dr. John Snow. So what he did was he come up with this map that you can see on the left hand side. So what he did was he mapped the location of the cholera people uh, who died because of this mysterious disease and also the location of the water pump. So blue you can see is the location of the water pump. The moment he comes up with the map, the picture or the pattern becomes evident. We see that most of these deaths are confined within the central water pump because we this cholera is a waterborne disease uh, and more because people were taking water from this water pump. So the first thing based on this map, he was able to convince the authorities and the first step was to take the handle off that uh, water pump and the number of cases come drastically coming down. So this was a pre-computer age where he was able to relate the, the location of the cholera depths with the location of the water pump from which the people were drawing the water and he come, he comes to the inference as uh, uh, that being a waterborne disease, uh, uh, the people are drawing this uh, water from this water pump and the necessary action could be taken and the, uh, the this kind of epidemic was kind of addressed. So this is a pre-computer age, so how to relate one phenomena with other and coming up and proving your hypothesis is not new as we have seen in the previous slide. Uh, coming to the broad classification, so one we can broadly classify as a vector or raster, but we can further classify either in the form of a measurement, retrieval, and classification based operations or functions that you have studied in the first part of this lecture. Uh, and then other is we can also uh, classify them as either as overlay function, which means combining two or more spatial data layers. We could also have a category of neighborhood function looking at the proximity surrounding the feature location and then we could also have some network based functions looking for the network analysis part. So broadly we can define categorize into these four categories uh, apart from the primary uh, classification of vector or raster and this overlay functions are neighborhood we can do uh, in the form of a both vector as well as raster based data sets. 
Uh, before moving further, let's first try to understand the basic principle of overlay operation, which it, as we have discussed means combining two or more layers together. So in order to perform an overlay, so there has to be some prerequisite, which is it requires two or more than two input data layers. So that could be either vector layers or that could be raster layers. And they are assumed to be of the same georeference in the same system, having the same coordinate system. And they should also overlap in the study area. And then as you can pretty much understand that if these conditions are not Met, then the overlay operator operation will be not of much meaning because there is no point in overlaying uh, the layers which don't overlap or are or not a particular of the same georeference. Uh, so the output result will be kind of a meaningless. But principally, what we are doing is we are comparing the characteristics of the same location in both the layers. So either it will be the raster layer cell by cell, and we are coming with the output cell, or we are for the polygon, we are comparing the characteristics of both the layers and then coming up with a new output. So, as the definition of spatial data analysis says, computing new information for getting the new insight from the existing stored data. So this overlay could be in the form of vector, let's say we are combining two layers together, we could be looking for the common region, we say intersection, or we are doing a kind of or operation or union operation. Similarly, in the case of a raster, we can add two rasters, or maybe we can compute like indices, maybe NDVI kind of a thing, so band back related operation could be done. So the overlay operations in the vector, uh, we could use intersection looking for common region or union, maybe getting the or operation, getting the, all the regions. And we could also get or maybe extract a portion from a vector wheel comparison and logical operators, like relational operators or Boolean operators, and or and not XOR. Or we could also use a series of conditional operators also. Now let's uh, spend some time in understanding the basic principle of a vector overlay. So as we said, we require at least two layers, which uh, have to be same georeference and they should overlap in the study region. So assuming these are two layers, layer one and layer two, layer one has two polygons identified as one and two. And in the attributes, there are two fields. One is an ID field and one is a class field. So the polygon one has a value of ID one and a class of zero. Polygon two of layer one has an ID of two and a class value of 100. Layer two consisting of two polygons, one and two, ID one and two, and it has an attribute of cost along with an ID attribute of having a value of 10 for one and five for. So if we try to overlay or maybe combine this on layer one and layer two, if you see interestingly in the output, we are getting more polygons than they are there in the layer one and layer two separately. But the important thing is look at this attribute table that is uh, that the new output layers has. So if you look at the output layer, it consists of four polygons, near number as one, two, three, and four. But the important thing is it is also inheriting the attributes from both the input layer, layer one and the layer two. Let's closely look at the polygon one. So now, as I said, we are overlaying this on the top of this. So wherever there was an intersection of the boundaries between this and this, you can see that the polygons have been created, numbered as one, two, three, and this part as four. So let me clear this out one, one more time. So we are overlaying this on this, and there are new polygons that are being computed based on the intersection of boundaries between the so now if you look at closely at the polygon one, you see that it has uh, inherited the, the attribute class value as zero from layer one based on the attribute value here. And similarly, it has got a value of attribute cost as 10. This is extracted from the layer two polygon one, this is the ID value for cost was 10. Similarly, if you look at this fourth polygon, let's see this fourth polygon, you will see that now this polygon is formed because this line from layer one is crossing 
this line in the roughly in the vertical position and this fourth polygon is created now this is since it is occupying a portion of two in the in the layer one and also the portion of two in layer two in the layer two so hence you will see that it has inherited the attributes uh, of class as 100 from the layer one and the layer two of value as five because it is falling under the region of uh, polygon two so the important thing in uh, the basic vector overlay as we said we require at least two layers georeference and then we are trying to compare the features together in this case uh, wherever there was intersection of boundaries the uh, new polygons were created and also the attribute values were also associated with the new polygons that we created which means <clears throat> Again, from a definition of spatial data analysis, we are computing new information based on the existing data that we have uh, that we are provided to us. So, assuming that these were the our land use map having only the agriculture, non-agriculture, and layer two, let's say administrative boundary. If I just overlay them, then I can find out how much agriculture land is there in administrative region one and administrative region. So taking independently, I will not be able to answer that, but on overlaying, I can compute that information on the fly. <laughs> Similarly, we can extend this. We could have also have a point in a polygon kind of an overlay operation. Assuming given a met station point map, I have information about three points, one, two, and three. And then I also have a forest polygon map denoting the forest and the non-forest regions. Now, once I do a point in a polygon kind of an overlay operation, I can now compute new information, which is knowing whether the met station, the points are within the forest region or outside the forest region. And if I just consider them have independently, then I would not be able to know them. But once I do this overlay, based on the overlay principle that we have studied, sorry, we are able to get the information whether the point is within the uh, forest region or outside because now in the attribute table of the output map we not only have the information from the point map or next station layer but also the attribute information coming from the polygon uh, map which is denotes the forest and non-forest so if you see this first point uh, so the point ID is one and from the overlay operation now I can also know that the land use for this is the forest because this is coming from inheriting the characteristics of attribute table of forest polygon map where the value for the attribute land use was mentioned as forest. Similarly, if you look at this point three, you can see that this is uh, coming under the non-forest region. So hence this it can be uh, Started based on this point and the polygon operation. Now this is this can be also be further analyzed. Maybe we can now count how many such met stations are within the forest regions and which are outside the forest regions. So point in polygon kind of overlays is very beneficial in most of the occasions. We can extend this to now line in a polygon overlay operation. So given a road line map, as you can see on the left hand side, I have a road line map. There are three road uh, lines, one uh, labeled as one, two, and three. And then again, we have a forest polygon map denoting the forest and the non forest region. The moment we overlay them, again, you can see that wherever there was intersection of uh, edges uh, or the segments, the new line segment has been computed. So if you see in the output road map, in the, there are five segments. There are five segments, whereas in the in input uh, line roadmap, there was only three segments. Now, this additional segment was created because of this, uh, the, the, the intersection of this or the crossing of this uh, line segment from this forest boundary region. So wherever there was an intersection of edge, a new segment has been created. So if you see, because of this crossing of this forest boundary, line one has been segmented into sorry multiple parts so one two and the fifth part similarly this line segment two has been further divided into segment three and segment four based on the intersection with the line segment of the forest boundary 
But importantly, as we have understood from the principle, uh, the new segments or new features will be created. However, the attribute information will also be inherited. So again, we now we can now find out what segments of the roads are within the forest and what segment of roads are outside the forest. So if you look at this segment one, from based on the uh, ID value of land use coming from this forest polygon map, we can know that this segment is within the forest. Similarly, this segment four, we can see that this is outside the forest or in the non-forest region because of this output from this overlay operation. So again, we are computing new information based on the existing information to maybe to use them in subsequent for our series of operations to be performed as a part of a bigger spatial operations to solve the, uh, the problem shape. So again, maybe uh, independently, if you look at this point and our polygon, we may not be able to understand whether the points are within the forest or non-forest, but by overlaying, we can compute this new information at one time. The other kinds of vector-based operations that we can do is, is the intersect or looking for the common region between the two, uh, two features. So assuming we are given two input uh, data sets, input one and input intersect data set or input layer two, input one has two polygons A and B, and in, uh, second intersect data set or input two has these four polygons colored as one, two, three, and four. Now straight away, since we are doing an intersect, which means we are looking for only the common region, so straight away you can identify this corners has been cut. This is because we are only looking for a common region. So if I just overlay on top of this, so this edges will be cut because we are only looking for the common region. And again, based on the overlay principles, we are able to extract or inherit the attributes of both the input layers. Now, if you look at this output uh, of the intersect operation, you will see that here we are getting around eight features in the output layer. <coughs> And again, you can see that these new features has been created based on the intersection between the, the geometries of input one and the input layer two. So if you look at this new polygon that is being created as four, and if you look at the attribute table of four, you will see that since this is coming within the regions of B, hence the input one value is coming as B. And since this is also falling under the polygon one of the input two layer, it is getting the value as one from that layer. Similarly, we can compute for the other region. Uh, let's see this polygon eight. So you can see that this, this is uh, occupying the A portion of the input layer one, and it is also coming under the region three of the input data set. Two, hence it is getting the value of input one as A, uh, as A and input two as A. Now this intersect is a quite useful operation, could be used in various ways. So assuming you have a landslide map and, and let's say you also have a vegetation type map. So then by just by overlaying the, uh, the landslide with the vegetation type map, you can identify the damage to the vegetation due to this landslide. <laughs> Sorry. Similarly, you can also overlay the landslide zone uh, with the, let's say, the road networks, and then you can identify the segment of the roads that are being damaged due to this landslide. So wherever you are looking for a common region, then you can use this intersect operations and could be a very, very useful tool in various applications. Other uh, vector-based operation that you can do is a union. As the name suggests, it is like combining the two layers. You can also, from your set theory, you can assume as an OR operation, because here we'll get the input from, the output will contain the input features from both the layers. Now, if you look at this uh, graphic carefully, there is a land parcel layer and there's a soil type layer. And I'm trying to do a sandwich or combine unioning then union operation on the land parcel and the soil type. So again, from our understanding of the overlay operations, new polygon will be created. In this case, the land parcels and the soil type. But the important thing is, all those new uh, polygons that are being created as a part of the output of this union operations, 
Now for each land parcel, I will also get the information about the soil type. So the land parcel details will be retained from the land parcel layer, whereas the soil information will come from the soil type. Again, as I said, if we have just considered land parcel separate and soil separate, so we'll not be able to associate the soil type value with the land use. But the moment we do a union, this information could be derived based on the input separate uh, layers, which is land parcels and the soil types. Now, to understand this in more detail, let's see this uh, graphic again. So, we are given an input uh, layer. One uh, purple object and yellow object. So this is our first input layer one, and this is our input layer two, named as purple and the yellow object. Purple object has two polygons, one and two, and this has an associated attribute ID and a station. Similarly, the yellow object has only two fields, ID and a type field. The first thing you should observe that I'm going back. I'm going to the previous slide. Uh, in the intersect, you'll see here we are only getting the common region, only the common region, hence these corners were being cropped. Whereas in the union, you see that I'm getting the whole region, which are either a part of purple object or the part of the yellow object. So that is the first thing we can observe. Second thing is, as we said, wherever there will be a intersection of geometries, the new polygons will be created. And then the attributes will be inherited from the input uh, from both the purple object as well as the yellow object that you can see in the in, in the in the graphic as well as the attribute table on the right hand side. So if you see in the union output, there are five polygons being created, whereas individually, if you look, purple object has two, and then the yellow object has only one polygon. Now, if you look closely at this polygon based on the output of the union operation. We see that this portion is coming under the purple object polygon 2, whereas uh, this region is coming under the yellow object, this part. Hence, if you look at the attribute table of this, you will see that this has the value of station as 2 and the value of uh, from the type as A because it is falling in this region. Similarly, if you look at only this region, which you can see here, it has only the type information which is coming from A, but null value coming from the station because this part is not part of the input purple object. So union, of, union will give you the combined information which are in features which are either in A or in B or in both. The other operation is the uh, clip or we call as a cookie cutter. So this you can assume like, uh, for example, let's consider that you are giving us some road network and you only want to chop it up or maybe extract only uh, the, uh, the road network that is crossing or maybe uh, uh, covering the, your study region. So just like we have a cutter and the dove, we can uh, use that dove and cutter kind of a concept. And then we can use the same concept analogy and apply it on a clip operation, which is then, uh, so we are only subsetting based on the, uh, the cutter, in this case, uh, our input region, the raster, which defines the area of interest that we want to chop on. The important thing to note here is there's no change in the attribute or the geometry. Only thing is the, the road network will be clipped to the extent of the, the cutter. In this case, I am defining using as a raster extent as the cutter. So there's no change in attribute information, only the subset of the information is being uh, retrieved. Again, this is quite useful in case, let's say you have a, you download some data of the whole country level, but you're working at the district level. So you provide a district boundary and say, only show me those roads that are crossing that uh, the that district particular boundary. So we can also do a subset. The, the other way of looking at this operation is the, uh, the opposite of this is a erase operation, wherein we have two, we require two input features. One is the input layer and second is the erase feature. But unlike the clip, which only gives you the portion that is uh, 
occupying the area of interest. Here, based on the erase feature, that uh, portion is being masked out or being extracted out from this output layer. So you'll get a donut kind of a shape. This is a quite useful operation wherein you want to mask out those regions or eliminate those regions so that uh, we can cut down on the complexity of the operation and the area we don't want to be participate in the further analysis. So erase primarily takes two input, the input layer as well as the erase feature, and it basically removes that portions from the output layer. Now to understand uh, this difference again from clip versus erase, we are taking the example of a dove and a cookie cutter. So important thing is the clip extract features inside the boundary, whereas erase keep the features key features outside the boundary. So assuming we have this input layer as a cookie dove and we have this clip or erase as a cookie cutter. And then if I use this for the clip, then whatever is inside this clip region will be, uh, will be given back. So clip keeps the cookies and this is gone So delete the, uh, the dove. So you will, in the clip, you will only get whatever is coming within your uh, the cookie cutter or the clip layer. Whereas in the case of an erase, look at this example, it primarily eliminates whatever is inside the clip or an erase layer, the cookie cutter layer, but retains the dove. Unlike clip, which just gives you the, keeps the cookie, but deletes the complete dove, it, uh, it, uh, in the case of an erase, it primarily keeps the dove and it erases the whatever is uh, coming within the erase region. So uh, please remember this uh, analogy will be quite beneficial in case you have doubt about uh, the difference between the clip and the erase operation. Now moving forward, you could also have a difference based operation. So you can subtract two layers. It could be input one minus input two or input two minus input one. And you could also have a symmetric difference. So this is like giving only those regions which are either in input one or in input two, but eliminating those regions which are in both. So this is an example of a symmetric difference operation. Similarly, we could also have a dissolve operation, <coughs> sorry, wherein instead of considering the whole region, we want to simplify them or we want to dissolve the adjacent boundaries among them and see them as a whole. Now this dissolve operation you could use in various situations. One may, one may be is, let's say given a, uh, the state boundaries, you want to dissolve all the state boundaries and come up with the, let's say the country bound. Other ways, let's say you have a, uh, the, the uh, a land use kind of a map, wherein instead of you have a categories like commercial, residential and so on. So instead of uh, seeing or analyzing individual land use parcels, uh, separately, we want to dissolve all the adjacent commercial or residential areas and see them as a whole. So in this kind of a situation, you can use this dissolve. Dissolve primarily takes one input layer and it dissolves the boundary based on the common attributes uh, among the adjacent regions. Another widely used operation is the buffer operation also called uh, as a proximity kind of an analysis is being used. The buffer can be assumed as a spatial proximity zone that we are creating among the, uh, in the features. So the feature could be point, line, or a polygon. In the case of point, it could be a buffer, we have to specify a distance. So it will be a circle. Similarly, we can create an elongated region along the line, and similarly along the polygon or an area feature. Now, as I said, this is quite useful operation. Maybe in various situations could be used. Uh, one, I'm just demonstrating if you, uh, on the right hand side, you can see an image and assuming that uh, uh, the road has to be widened and the 
the, uh, the number of shops or complexes that are coming within that region of elongation of the road has to be relocated or compensated, then we can make use of this buffer operations. So we are making a buffer of 60 meters on either side of the road, and then we can find out how many of those establishments are coming within that zone, so that those so first we can identify those uh, complexes or those uh, shops etc that are coming within this uh, buffer regions which are caused due to the expansion of the road so first we could identify and subsequently those people could be asked to relocate and then some compensation etc could be given now we could have multi instead of having only one uh, kind of a buffer we could also create multi uh, ring buffers which means multiple series of buffers could be created and this is also quite uh, widely used let's say we want to we have a and given the segments of the road and then we have some let's say primary school facilities then we can find out how many of those if you are looking for how many of those schools can be accessible within 0 to 100 meter then 100 to 200 meter and 200 to 300 meter kind of thing we can use these kinds of multi ring buffer so here you can see that we have created a multi-ring buffer based on the on the segments of the road. So the first distance is from zero to hundred, then hundred to two hundred, and two hundred to three. So only unlike maybe here we have only a single uh, buffer, we could create a, a ring of buffers which denotes the distances. So whatever you can see in dark purple is a distance. Uh, within 0 to 100 and whatever in light colors you are seeing from 100 to 200 followed by 200 to 300 meters. So given these buffer zones that we have created, now as I said, uh, given the primary health, uh, primary schools, we can find out how many of those schools are within those different zones. Now, having talked about the vector-based operations, we covered the basic principles of vector-based operations, followed by point-in-line, uh, point-in-polygon operation, line-in-polygon operations, followed by looking at the intersect operation, union, clip, erase, symmetric difference, dissolve. Now, let's now talk about the raster-based uh, operations. Again, we'll cover all those categories of overlay. So, unlike in raster, the in vector, sorry, in raster, the new cell values are computed on a cell by cell basis using something we call as a map algebra or algebra based on the multiple raster layers. So, we can perform various kinds of operations. It could be arithmetic operations, it could be relational operators, it could be a combination of all. But they are done on a cell by cell basis, and there, there is no geometric calculation involved because we uh, assume that both uh, the resolution of the two rasters are the same. We can also represent by just one line of statement as a overlay operation, which is the output raster will be a series of uh, input raster layers uh, arranged using a map algebra using some operations. A simple example is shown on the right hand side here. Suppose we are given a land use map having various classes and a slope map having again various slope classes. So we want to find out those areas which where the land use type is forest and the slope is steep. So here you can see we are having two layers, land use and slope layer, raster. From the land use, we are extracting those regions which are forest. And then from the slope, we are extracting those regions which are steep. And then we are using the, the logical operator here in the case of AND, which means give me only those places where the, the area is also forest as well as the, the slope is steep. So we can perform those kinds of operations. Now again, looking back from the definition, so we are computing new information based on the existing information and finding out the areas that are suitable for our subsequent schedule. Primarily, raster operation could be defined into uh, four categories. So it could be the local operation, which means done on an individual cell basis, the neighborhood, etc., are not considered. Second is the focal operations, where apart from the individual cell location, 
the surrounding or the neighborhood is also being considered. Third is, instead of looking them as cell by cell or the neighborhood, we consider as a zone or a group of pixels having the same value denoting the zone. And we want to perform operations on those, considering this zone as a unit in, instead of individual cells or a group of cells. Fourth is the global operation where you perform the operation on the entire image that could be computing the scatter text, the mean value, the standard deviation, or maybe finding out the equilibrium distance based on our input uh, points or a line width. Let's go one by one, one on these raster based operations. The first is a local, as we said, it's done on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So given this input layer one and input layer two, so we'll see both this, uh, the pixels at the corresponding position and compute the new value for the output. Okay. So basically it computes the output cell values as a function of the input cell values. So remember this statement that we say, output raster is will be a raster uh, involved using a map algebra or an expression will be used. Now we could uh, perform this local operation either on a single raster or we could have a group of uh, multiple rasters. Now in raster, you will come across a term as no data cells. Now this no data means the value is not defined or is not available at those cells. Now this is different from zero value which denotes a value in the raster. So primarily a no data is a depiction uh, in a raster to tell the system or the software that we don't have a value for these pixels and so kindly exclude them or maybe from uh, the calculations. And wherever the no data values are encountered, the system kind of ignores it uh, if it is available on uh, uh, either of the uh, input layers. The common example of the local operation is the overlay and the reclassification operations. We'll see them in the subsequent slides. The first is the, the, uh, the we are performing on the single raster. So assuming that we have an input raster given here, a group of pixels denoting some elevation values. Let's say you want to perform a simple arithmetic operator of addition. So what we are doing is we are adding the value 10 to each and every pixel. So if you look at this, this is input A, initial value was five, I'm adding a value 10. So hence it becomes 15. Similarly, if you look at this pixel, the value is two and I'm adding 10, it becomes so basically we are looking at, as I said, each cell value and then computing new value, in this case adding the value of 10. This could be done on a single band or this could be also involved multiple layers or multiple bands. Um, the classic example may be your computing of indices. I say you want to compute the uh, NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index, where you have NIR band and the red band, and then you can compute that band map kind of uh, operations. However, we can also involve some uh, logical expression could also be used uh, in performing these local operations. So here is given the Venn diagram depicting the, uh, the meaning of the AND or NOT and XOR kind of operations. So AND uh, will give you only those features which are available in both the input A and input B. Uh, AND is your intersect operation or a common region. Similarly, R is a union operation which gives you the, uh, the features which are either in A or, or in B or they are in both. Not, as you can see, is the negation, only those features which are in A and not in B. Similarly, if you look at this XOR, you can see that this is a negation of this. So XOR, also known as exclusive OR, gives you only those uh, features or region which are either in A or in B, but not in both, not in both. So this is meaning of the exclusive or. So now uh, given this expression, let's say we are given a input layer and depicting the forest on the non-forest zones. And then we are giving an input layer B, denoting the elevation values of seven, six, and four, denoting 700 meters, 600 meters, and 400 meters. Let's say you, you want to compute an expression where the value of input layer is forest and the value of B is less than 500. 
So let's consider this pixels in the input layers. So this is our pixel and this is our pixels. So let's see the first condition because this and which means both the condition has to be satisfied. So whether this pixel is forest, yes, it is forest. So this part is ticked. So the output of this part is true. And let's look at this, uh, the subsequent pixel or the corresponding pixel in B, the value should be less than 400. And, and you can see that the value is four, which is less than five, uh, 500. Hence, you are getting this pixels in the output. So output will be the binary one or zero. Let's consider this pixel output here. And let's see why this has not come. So if you see, this is the forest region. So let me just clear it out. So we are now trying to see this pixel. The input, this is the value for this pixel. And input, this is the value for this pixel. So whether the value of A is forest, yes, this is true. And since again it is and, so both condition has to be true. Whether the value of B is less than 500, no, the value is 7, which means 700. So this becomes false. And based on the truth tip or the Venn diagram that we can see that in case for and, both the condition has to be true. Here it is true and then false, so output will be false. Hence, this is not coming in the output. Image is not being labeled as 1. Uh, it's been labeled as zero. Similarly, we could also have this and or an uh, not kind of an operation could be added. I'm just considering one more case. So let's consider this XOR expression. So here in this expression, we are saying A equal to forest and B should be less than 500. And remember that in the XOR operation, the condition should be either of the conditions should be true, but not both of the conditions should be true. So hence, let's see this value, see this pixels. So we have this on the input pixels and this on the input pixel. So we see, consider the A equal to forest. This answer is false. And, and the value of B is less than uh, uh, five. Uh, yes, it is two, it is four. So we can see that XOR will give you only those values which are either uh, uh, where the values <laughs> Uh, is uh, either in A or in B, but not in the both the conditions. And subsequently, you can also look at this not and other kinds of operations could be also being added. So important thing is, apart from basic arithmetic operations, we can also make use of these logical operations to compute the value. Now, Moving on, so local uh, operation example is a reclassification where we are computing or assigning a new value to the existing value. This could be given to the continuous raster as well as the discrete raster. Given this input uh, continuous raster showing the distance to the road ranging from uh, 0 to 34,000 meters, let's say. We can reclassify them into different preference or suitability. For example, the reason between 0 to 10,000 meter could be assigned as value 1, then 10 to 20,000 as 2, and this as 3. So we can reclassify them into three zones. Now, so reclassification is primarily using various situations. One is maybe giving new values to the old values. So in the GIS software, once you perform this operation, you will get a table where the old values will be given and you can assign them as a new value. Similarly, uh, reclassification can also be done on a discrete raster. So given a land use map of various categories or classes, 21, 22, 23, 43, and 81, I can reclassify again based on preference, given them as low, medium, or high. And I can also use this reclassification to also assign some pixel values of no data so that I don't want them to be part of my analysis anymore. Because we have discussed and anytime it finds a no data, the system just uh, does not consider those pixel values. So again, as I said, uh, uh, in the software, you will be provided a table where you can assign different old values to a new value. So if you look at this 21, the purple color, it is assigned as a value 1, denoting as low. And similarly, if you look at this 43 region, it will be assigned as a value of and if you look at it closely, you will see that this 22 
is being given as a no data value so hence it is not being considered further in the analysis the next operation is the, our focal operations and as the name suggests we are not only considering the individual cell locations but we are also considering the neighborhood denoting by the window size there could be various kinds of focal statistics operation that we can perform it could be sum it could be mean and other kinds of operations so given an example here i have an input raster denoting this values and i'm looking to compute the sum so i have just only highlighted this portion in the below image so you can see the values of 3 2 3 5 4 and i want to compute the focal sum of the central window that we are moving across this region so we are getting the output of focal sum as 24 the reason the reason being is we are we are doing a sum of the neighborhood along with the central pixel values so if we just sum the values of 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 2 Plus one, plus four, and add to the central pixel value. You will get the value as twenty-four. So, like this, you can perform the mean operations and other kind of operation could be done. And this focal operation similar to your convolution operation that you must have studied in your previous module. The third category of operation that comes under the raster uh, category is the zonal operations. Where I said up till now we are considering only the raster, either cell by cell or cell and the surrounding. But we can also consider the uh, zones in the raster as the inputs. So primarily for the zonal uh, raster operation, we require two input. One is the input raster or value raster we say, and second is the zone layer. A zone layer we could use either as a raster, also as a vector to define the zone. Only in the case should be raster should have an attribute table associated with that, denoting the value for those zones. And the output we can get various kinds of information. It could be the majority, the minority, the types of values that are available. That could be expected. So assuming that I am giving some zones for the soil classes, and I have an elevation as a value layer, I can find out with reference to these soil zones what is the average or maximum elevation. So based on this, uh, this kind of operation can be done. So as I said, the output of the zonal operation either could be a raster layer, wherein all the pixels of the zone will get the same value of the output raster. Or the, uh, the output of the zonal operation could also be in the form of a table, wherein for there will be a output will be the DBF file consisting of attributes, ID column for the zone, and the associated uh, output of the zonal operation that you want. It could be the majority, minority, sum, median, average, variety. Those kinds of operations can be done in the form of a extracted uh, either as a raster layer or as a In the form of a table, the advantage of a table could be that since it is a DBF file, you can join back to the zone layer and use in the subsequent processing also. Let's try to understand this one more. Uh, sorry, in um, graphic. So, given this uh, zone maps, blue zone and yellow zone. So, blue zone has uh, four pixels and uh, yellow zone uh, five pixels, and I am given an elevation map uh, denoting these values, and I want to perform this zonal mean. As I said, the output for each zone, each zone will get the same pixel value. In this case, is a zonal mean. So let's say we consider this blue zone, and we are looking at the mean value. So four. So if you see the values are four, two, one, and five. So if you sum them, you will get the value as twelve. And twelve, there are four pixels. Uh, so the mean value will be three. And you see that the three is assigned to each and every. Um, Pixels that they denote as a zone. Similarly, if you look at the yellow pixels, and if you sum them again, you will see that five, five are ten, and then this becomes uh, also fifteen, uh, and this five becomes twenty, and then divide by four, the mean value will be four, and then we are putting the values inside those zones. So zones operation, as I said, is is useful when instead of considering the pixel by pixels, we want to extract the information as a zone, uh, and then use it uh, to compute the information from the 
zone perspective, not in the cell by cell, but a neighbor perspective. The fourth type of operation is a global operation. As I said, it's performed on the whole uh, cluster layer. The classic example is the equilibrium distance, wherein uh, each pixel will contain the value how far it is from the nearest feature it is passing So given this road segment, here you can see the output of the equilibrium distance function, wherein the each pixel contains the how far it is from the nearest street segment. And as we discussed, this output could be further reclassified. You can put them into suitability classes and then use them in your further subsequent operations. Now, as I said, there are multiple gamut of operations. I have, I have only covered the, ma the major classes of operations. Uh, another category of operations uh, uh, that again can be in the form of the, your neighborhood operations are the slope or a dem based operation that you perform, considered as a, as a Focal or neighborhood operation or slope. So, given a dim, you can find the slope, the aspects, and the contours would also be extracted. Now, as I said, that most of the raster based operations are done using a map, algebra based expressions, and then most of the GIS software has a utility called as the raster calculator, wherein you can load uh, whatever raster layers you have loaded into your table of contents. Uh, you can perform various operations. It could be arithmetic operation, logical operations, and then the output. It, it will be in the form of a, uh, either whether the, uh, the condition is satisfied or not. Let's say if you are given a dem, you want to find only those elevation values which are greater than certain number, and output will be stored as a new layer. Then you will get the output in the form of a binary, which is one and zero or true or false. The region which are satisfying this condition will get the value as true, and rest will be given the value as so most of the raster based operation you can perform using this raster based calculator and you can use write any complex expression using the various operations or tools that are available in this vendor. Now let me also briefly uh, touch upon the, uh, the network based operation. There will be a separate lecture on the coming days, but this is again a very, very useful operation when it comes to the spatial data analysis part and then maybe widely used among the community general public in sense uh, the shortest route so given a road network we can we can find the shortest route the route could be either in the form of a minimum length or shortest distance or it could be also in the form of a minimum time to travel maybe the classic example is your google maps which provides this kind of functionality and also provides the traffic related real-time information also uh, the another category of this network based operation is the service area identification based on the time. So let's say given the fire station and then we want to find out how much uh, the distance could be covered by that uh, or supported by that fire station within a travel time of 10 minutes. So we can identify that service area. Similarly, we can also find the service area for parks or schools based on the travel distance or whether we can person can travel within one kilometer, two kilometer, and three kilometers, so we can also define the areas. So this is quite useful when you want to, for the commercial perspective, when they're looking for how many customers they can support within that region. So this is a quite useful. Now, having talked about uh, what we mean by spatial data analysis, what are the various broad categories, either in a vector or a raster, based on the data models that we have chosen? Followed by studying the, uh, the, uh, the basic principles of overlay, which is we require two input layers, has, has to be georeferenced, and has to overlap in a common region. And we understood the basic principle of the overlay, especially in the vector sense, not only the geometries are being newly created, but the attributes are also inherited. Then we uh, will gone into the various operations under the vector domain. We have seen the intersect operation, the union, the clip, the symmetric difference, the dissolve, the erase, and other kinds of operations. Similarly, in the raster, we have seen uh, the four major types of operations, which are local, focal, zone, and global. Now, let's also spend some time in comparing this vector and raster-based operations. But we know that the vector raster data analysis are primarily two types of analysis that a software will provide. 
Now, most of the GIS software, they are treated separately because most of the software cannot run them together in the same operations. However, the GIS software do provide the capabilities or tools to convert from either. So you can convert from vector to the raster and then vice versa. So those tools are available. However, there are some tools wherein the GIS software allow you to use vector data in some raster based operations. Let's say you want to extract by mass kind of a thing. Then you can define your uh, extractant portion either through a vector denoting the boundary or you can also give a raster. But internally, when you perform this operation, GIS convert them into the raster before the operation starts. So there is an overhead cost of internally it will convert. So primarily, the thing is there are a vector and raster based operation and GIS can only perform, um, can work either in vector mode or in a raster mode. However, some of the tools do provide the capabilities of providing vector input in the case of raster based operation. But at the back end, uh, those input and are anyway converted into raster before the operation could be started. The other way of looking at it is uh, whether to use vector or raster primarily depend on the project that you are working on, type of data source and objectives that you have. Because uh, uh, I, maybe you can recollect the advantage of raster versus vector. So there's a common um, saying that, that the rasters are faster, but vector are more character. Right, so raster occupies more space, vector R occupies less space. In vector, the topology and the network could be best represented, whereas in raster, those things are difficult. But however, in raster, the operations are fast, uh, can be done in very, very efficient manner. But primarily, it boils down to uh, what kind of data it is available to you, and it is in which format, what kind of software is available, and whether depending on the data complexity, as I said, Vector is a more complex uh, model to perform operation because the topology has to be built in and those corrections related to the topology like sliver polygon removal, uh, the overshoot understood has to be handled before the data could be performed. Now, having talked about this, now let's go back and try to see the differences among them and the advantage one over the other. For this, I'm considering the two popular operations. I'm considering the overlay and buffering. We'll cover separately. So first, we'll try to understand the overlay uh, operation. So I can say that the overlay operation in the case, I'm considering a local operation with multiple raster is same as the overlay operation and the vector overlay operation. So the local operation of uh, multiple raster is same as the vector overlay operations. Uh, we can assume uh, it is the same. However, there are some differences that we can see. So uh, I'm saying that the local operation of vector can be uh, is, is similar to your, uh, the local operation in raster, sorry, is similar to your vector based overlay operations. We are considering cell by cell the values. But let's see the differences. The first thing is the vector based overlay must compute the intersection between the features and insert point or new geometries are uh, created wherever there is the intersection of the boundaries that we have seen in our basic principle. Now, if you look at from the raster perspective, this is not the case. It's not necessary for the raster based operation because uh, for the raster, the input uh, generally have the same cell size and also they have the same extent. And even if they are not, we can Resample them before performing this local based operation on the multiple clusters. Now, if you look at the computation perspective, as I said, it's less complicated than calculating, calculating sorry, that line intersection and then computing new geometries, building the topology, etc. Even there's an overhead, as I said, of resampling of the two raster in case the, the cell size are not the same. The another way of looking at the raster based local operation is we have access to various tools and operators. So we have talked about arithmetic, logical, relational, and those kind of operators could be used. Whereas we have seen in our based on the previous slide, the vector based overlay primarily combines attributes of input layer. And then the operation we can do is either, uh, let's say, the intersect, the union, and those kinds of operations. Whereas in the case of a raster, we can apply various tools and operators, whereas in vector, it primarily is uh, combining the attributes from the input layer. So any operation that we want to perform on the uh, 
combined attribute must be a separate step, a step that you follow after the vector formulation. Now, having said that, the raster based overlay is often preferred for projects that we have a large number of layers and there's a considerable amount of computation has to be done because we, as we have talked about, uh, the raster is good for where you want to perform the computation very fast because it is done on a cell by cell basis. There's no overhead. It's a very simple operation. However, for the vector overlay operation, it has also advantages. As we said that it can combine multiple attributes for, from multiple input layers. And once the output is uh, generated, the, all the attributes will be combined and then we can perform queries on the attributes and analyze them individually or in combination. So this option is available. Which means once the, our overlay operation is done, the attributes can be inherited, which will be coming in our output layer. And then we can perform some operations based on the new extracted attributes. And then we can look at either individually or in a group. Whereas in the raster, as you know that for each raster, there has to be a single attribute only. So assuming you are storing a, a soil as soil not as raster having multiple attributes, and for each attribute, you have to create a separate raster. However, there is a way around of creating an attribute table and linking them, but primarily uh, one raster can represent only one uh, kind of an attribute only. So this is from the perspective of overlay. <laughs> Here we are performing, let's say, local operation of multiple raster and vector overlay. So we talked about the advantages of vector vis-a-vis -vis the raster. Uh, so what thing you should be considering? The other operation that we can focus on is the buffering. So we can perform the buffer operation, approximate basic analysis either on a vector or we can also perform on raster based on the physical distance measurement is similar. So buffering can be is similar to your uh, distance based measurement that you can do to raster. So basically both measure distance from the same features. However, there are few differences that we should know of. This is again coming from the underlying data model in which the data is being represented. So remember that initially we talked about the vector and raster, how we are representing the real world phenomenon. So for each uh, vector based feature, the coordinate are specifically stored. So primarily the buffer operation in vector uses the XY coordinates of the pixels in measuring the distance, whereas the raster based operation use cells as a means for measuring the physical distance. So even if the Distances are not in the cell resolution, even half of the pixel is being coming is being assumed as a full pixel. So, meaning thereby that buffering can create a more accurate buffer zones, can create a more accurate buffer zone than the raster based operations, because here the distance will be done on the actual coordinates. So the important point is, if you are considering the accuracy as, a, uh, as an important thing, for example, you want to implement a referee zone management program where there is a strict accuracy guidelines of the distance, then maybe this vector-based buffering would be uh, better. Now, having said that, buffering in the case of a vector gives us multiple options also. So as we have discussed, we can create multiple zones or multiple rings of buffers. Whereas in the raster-based operations, uh, we could have a continuous distance measures. And then, as I said, we could reclassify them into different zones. So in the buffer, we could have in the vector, we have, we have multiple flexibility. In the, in the sense, we could have multiple buffer zones created, which are accurate. Whereas in raster, we can have a distance measurement and then we can reclassify and define them into different zones. So buffering operation has an option, as I said, for creating buffer zones for the select features. And the important thing, as I said, we have learned the dissolve also. So we can dissolve the, these regions and create a one bigger polygon instead of considering the individual small polygons individually. Now this type of thing is very, very difficult to do in a separate distance measures. Uh, using the raster-based operations. So, so these are the few points I thought will be uh, 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 you can consider while uh, looking at the options of vector or rasters. So, uh, so 
So please again go back to your primary the, the way the data is being stored, the advantages of raster versus vector, and then consider them before uh, deciding on whether should we go for the vector or raster. But as, as I said initially, most is determined primarily from the type of input that you have got. And also depends on the, uh, the type of task you are performing. If it's highly computed task, we, for, for example, mostly the people prefer to do is in the raster base because we can perform the operations very, very fast today. However, there are a few points that we have discussed, especially regarding the overlay and the buffering that you, you should consider wherever there is a uh, restriction of accuracy and what kind of operation that you perform and the kind of flexibility the operation of vector versus raster gives you. So with this, I will close and then maybe you can put on, uh, you can put in the chat your questions and then after a few minutes, I will take up your questions. Thank you.